You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this special episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we are talking to two authors who have written a book called An Environmental History of the Civil War. Um, It is a fascinating book. Uh, For those of you who are interested in all of the other stuff surrounding the armies, um, this is the book for you, I think. Uh, And also its it's impact on the environment, how they uh, lived with the environment, how they changed the environment. There's just so many different things that you can learn in this book, I highly recommend that you get it. And um, we're very lucky to have both of the authors on today. Who are the authors? Well, first of all, we have the extraordinarily good looking Judkin Browning. He's a professor <laughs> of military history at Appalachian State <laughs> University. Did I say it right? Appalachian or? That's it. Okay. Appalachian State University and the, uh, the author of Shifting Loyalties, the Union Occupation of Eastern North Carolina. And we also have a witty conversationalist named Timothy Silver, and he is a <laughs> professor of environmental history at Appalachian State University and author of Mount Mitchell and the Black Mountains and Environmental History of the Highest Peaks in Eastern America. And together they wrote Environmental History of the Civil War. And here they are with us on Addressing Gettysburg today. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for accepting our invitation. So um, for, let's get into what, how'd you guys come about uh, writing this book together? Whose idea was it? How'd you do it? All that jazz. Why did you take do it, it away? Well, um, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and claim that it was my idea um, <laughs> to, to do the book. And, and Jack can not argue with me too much. Um, I, I had thought for a long time about um, doing an environmental history of the Civil War because environmental historians believe that it's impossible really to understand any event in human history without looking at the natural world in which that event took place. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'd often thought the Civil War was, uh, was right for that kind of a study. Um, unfortunately, I discovered, well, maybe fortunately for Civil War historians, but I discovered that it was the most written about the event in American history with about, uh, you know, 50 to 60,000 books already out there. And um, in this lifetime, there was no way I was going to master that literature. I could do the environmental stuff, but not the Civil War stuff. Right. Um, so uh, one day I was actually reading a journal article about uh, chestnut blight, believe it or not, and I noticed that the uh, the um, biologist who had written the article had called in a geneticist to help him, and suddenly it was like something hit me upside the head, and I thought, you know, why don't I just call in a military historian who understands the Civil War? And so, you know, I called Judkin and... Uh, cajoled for a while and he he agreed to come on board and that makes so. sense you know you get someone who can speak to it uh, you, so w- real quick explain to our listeners what exactly the field of environmental history is before we move on to uh when judkin comes in i want to get that background in there yeah well as i said you know the, the sort of fundamental premise of environmental history is that to understand any human action you have to understand the physical environment in which that human action took place. In other words, um, you know, for example, you couldn't really write about something happening today without writing about, you know, COVID-19 and everything that's, that's going on with that. And so what we try to do is recreate the past um, environment in which people operated and functioned on a day-to-day basis. And uh, a simpler way of explaining it that I always tell students is it's history with the plants and animals left in. (laughs) Okay. Not left out as they so often are. Right. But it makes total sense. We are limited by our environment. So that has a huge impact on how history unfolds. So that's a, uh, it's an interesting topic. I've never heard of it until I've, discovered this book and then so that's i'm glad uh i'm glad you cleared that up for me so uh now judkin gets involved in the uh in the book judkin uh were you excited when he asked you to do this or were you like oh this is a daunting <laughs> task or what was your reaction um so so when we first when he first so 
When we first came up with the idea or first started talking about it, it was back in the summer of 2011. We were actually in a long car ride to Washington, D.C. to watch some baseball games, um, actually. And and I was working on a seven day, a book on the seven days battles. Tim was working on an article and we started talking about he was looking at an environmental angle. and I was doing a more traditional military history. And so it was just that conversation, I think, that planted the seed. And so when Tim came to me about a year later and said, hey, I want to do this book and you want to do it with me. I was a bit hesitant because I was working on other projects at the time, but he was like, you know, this will be back burner. Don't worry. We'll just work on this a little bit at a time over the next few years. And so I was like, sure, let's do it. And then we had the, uh, uh, the misfortune or fortune. Uh, actually, the, we were very fortunate. We got a, we got a, a pretty sizable grant from the American council of learned societies to, uh, to work on this book. And so suddenly it went from being back burner to front burner. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I was excited um, to work on it, especially once I started digging into it and realized that, uh, you know, as a military historian, there's environmental aspects that all military historians pay at least some lip service to, uh, such as weather or the health of soldiers and mm, things like that. Yeah. But when we really started researching in this and I started recognizing all the different questions that you could ask of these well understood military events, it really became uh, an exciting project for me. And so it was an, it was an enjoyable ride mostly, uh, throughout the book. How do you find, uh, I, I guess, I guess you have to use a lot of, uh, uh, firsthand accounts to get those details about environment and, you know, food and animals and things like that. Right. I mean, cause I mean, not, like I said before, I have always been interested in that stuff when I hear about it, but when I read a general history of whether it's a battle or a campaign or a regiment or whatever, I mean, I notice in the regimental histories, you might find a little bit more detail like that, or if it's someone's memoirs, of course. Mm -hmm. But when you're finding those general histories, like they, they might mention them here and there where it's like a colorful anecdote or something, but they really don't get into it, into it, at least as far as I've found so far. So where do you go to find all that information? Well, so it's twofold. Uh, one is, you're right, that most of the anecdotes and stuff that sort of drove uh, our research came from the very well-known uh, primary sources that uh, most Civil War scholars and Civil War buffs are aware of. The 128-volume uh, official records um, of the war, obviously, uh, published soldier diaries and, and letters, some memoirs, unpublished soldier diary and letters. And, you know, soldiers are very good about writing about mundane things. You know, the weather, sort of unusual events like, you know, animals and, and gruesome deaths and, and bad water, things like that. And so once you sort of see what the soldiers are saying, then uh, an environmentalist comes in and basically starts uh, rooting into the sort of scientific uh, underlying of what's going on here. And Tim and I joke that to quote Matt Damon in the movie, The Martian, um, that we were gonna science the shit out of this. Um, but, <laughs> and and that's sort of what happens. I mean, it's one thing to hear soldiers write and talk about, well, 90% of our regiment are sick with typhoid fever. And then the question is, well, where does typhoid fever come from? Right. Why is that? And so then I handed the Tim and he roots around epidemiology databases and, you know, tackles that yeah and so that's kind of that's how we blended our different expertises and what like like for example yeah so uh there's one thing in there um there's a couple of terms that are jumping out right one is called uh, stem rust for a crop <laughs> uh, <laughs> which i had never heard before and then uh something was a greasy greased heel what is greased it heel. Heel. Yeah. greased heel yeah yeah. So, so these are things uh, that are very real. They affect the food. They affect the animals. The animals are very important because they get the armies around. We're talking horses and mules and stuff at this point. So they get the, their transportation, their uh, labor, uh, very important things for an army. Um, so what is, what is grease seal by the way, just to. It's a, it's a problem with horses, and it's it's sort of what it sounds like. It's a, an inflammation and then an infection of uh, the lower leg of horses, and it can be caused by a variety of, of bacteria, fungi, um, several different causes for it. Um, but it usually happens when horses are forced into crowded 
um, unsanitary conditions where they have to stand around in a lot of mud and they're on excrement and that kind of thing. And it's, it's completely disabling for horses. And it became a problem in the Civil War when you brought all these horses together um, and then put them under those conditions. And it could, it could cause horses to, to come up lame. And then if that happens, you've got no way to move anything. Um, everything that moved during the Civil War, pretty much if, except the soldiers walking, moves by animal power whether it's uh, artillery, supply wagons, whatever. So it could be incredibly devastating. And the only cure for a uh, greased or greasy heel was to just sort of take the, the horses out of action for a while and um, let them recover under better, more sanitary conditions. And so, you know, that's a good example of, of uh, the kind of research we were doing where you would read something like greasy heel and then, you know, get into the, to the, veterinary literature and say, well, wait a minute, is that really a thing? And what, (laughs) yeah, um, you know, what can we, what can we discern from that? So not only were, you know, we hear about soldiers uh, all coming together and getting all these uh, communicable diseases from, you know, being crowded in these nasty camps and just being around a lot of people and everything, but it's same thing happens to the animals. It's not just people. Yeah. Uh, much worse than greased heel was uh, a disease among horses called glanders or farsi. Mm. Oh, yeah, and, that was another one I marked down. Yeah, to it's, called, it's caused by bacteria, and it's usually fatal if it takes the form of glanders. Sometimes they recover from farsi. Um, but that was, that was far more uh, common because you brought horses together from all over the country, um, previously isolated, and then it only takes one horse that's infected to set off, you know, a, an epidemic or an epizootic is what it's called uh, among hmm. animals. Hmm. And um, uh, there are a lot of good stories that go along with that. Um, after the uh, first Battle of Bull Run, I believe I should let Jack and talk about battles. He's better than that at that than me. <laughs> after the first uh, Battle of Bull Run, sort of each side accused the other of leaving behind infected horses mm. a kind of a, a, an equine weapon of mass destruction right uh, yeah and what what did uh like how did glanders affect them what was it exactly it's a glanders is a respiratory disease and it causes uh congestion in the uh, horse's respiratory system and they can they can actually suffocate from it oh wow and it it progresses in fairly quickly and if you, it, it, there, there wasn't really much that could be done. You, most time, you just had to put the animal down, shoot it, and uh, and leave it. It's uh, it's amazing. The the more, you know, you know that war is just a horror show everywhere you go. But then, learning about the animals and everything that they had to go through. Uh, I don't know. We, we tend to, it seems like a, a humans tend to feel sorry for animals more than other humans. And so you, you hear about, you know, them riding horses to death and then just getting another one and riding it to death. And, you know, they're at the mercy of what's required by the service. And uh, you, you go, God, this is so sad. It's like now it's more of a horror show to me than it already was from hearing about the human toll. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, is- go ahead. And that's true, too. I mean, we mentioned in the book how, you know, there are famous examples of guys who have personal relationships with their horses, why they're very fond of their horses. Yeah. Daniel Webster is the horse of George McClellan, you know, of course, traveler uh, right. for Robert. E. But that throughout the war, in the eyes of the army, horses really were just sort of living machines, yes. uh, like used cars. And, you know, if this, one, if this one's worn out, let's, you know, get rid of it and, and get another one because, um, you know, they had a war to fight and it, it really was, uh, you know, sort of a horse Holocaust. I mean, the civil war, I mean, one out of every six horses in the United States died during those four years and kind of hard to fathom about how many horses were there in the United States at the outbreak of the war. There were about 6 million horses when the war began and, and about 1.2 million died. You in the book, you uh, you say, uh, like their civilian counterparts, the animals first had to be pulled from civilian life and made ready for battle. So what what did that process entail? What was it like to train a horse to be a soldier? (laughs) Well, I'm not (laughs) it wasn't a very smooth operation Um, to to put it in comparison, uh, European observers ridiculed uh, American cavalry um, all through the war. 
This episode is now available over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Please help support the show and become a patron today.